Reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may count my, make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall, you be name, shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And a reading from the book of Romans Chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, this is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He was openly talking about this, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but man's. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his life? 
What can a man give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And do thy ministers in, with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. Let thy way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. We beseech you, God, to care for all that are hurting, lost, or grieving. And we are humbly thankful for your continual attendance to the needs of the Beeson community. We pray for the faculty, staff, and students, that they may be encouraged in their daily study of your word. For Mary Dorset, Francis Gaston, Armstead Herndon, and James Earl Massey, we pray for healing and persevering strength. We pray your blessing upon Parker and Kyra Wendell as they serve your kingdom in France, and for all missionaries, that your spirit would comfort and inspire Christians all around the world. And today we pray for Dr. Pasquarello, that your word may be proclaimed. Now as Christ our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, send your spirit, and kindle our hearts, and illumine our minds that we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. When Jim Pounds emailed me to ask about preaching texts for this morning's service, I did what has been my habit for 35 years. I looked at the lectionary and found the scripture lessons for this past Sunday. In this case, the second Sunday in the season of Lent. The gospel story is a familiar one, the encounter between Peter and Jesus. I would imagine during the years I was a pastor, I preached from this text just about every time it showed up in the lectionary, which can be several times in the Christian year. We preachers like Peter. He's a rather large personality, yet one who seems so down to earth and human. To put this in preacher talk, you could say he's relevant and accessible. That his all too evident failures and shortcomings resonate deeply with people. Peter is hardly the picture of a stained glass saint. But I think another reason preachers love Peter is that he provides cover for our desire to assert ourselves more forcefully in preaching. What I mean by this is that Peter can function metaphorically as a hermeneutical blank check onto which we can write those things we determine need to be critiqued, challenged, and changed. And I must confess to you that I've done this myself with more than one sermon from Peter's story. These are the kind of sermons preachers like to describe as prophetic a time when the preacher can get passive-aggressive, calling out for sharp criticism all kinds of people, groups, attitudes, opinions, ways of thinking and living, all in the name of God, 
when the preacher does not agree with or like them. So when I saw Peter was our gospel lesson for this past Sunday, my homiletical imagination shifted into high gear. This is what typically happens when I try to prepare a sermon. I read the text and my mind is immediately flooded with impressions, perceptions, images, ideas, even whole sermon outlines that have a good feel about them. And so I quickly created in my mind a sermon for today's service, a sermon I thought would be fitting for a seminary audience, a sermon focusing on Peter who shows us what to avoid and what to do in the practice of ministry. You know, something like this. Bless his heart. Poor Peter just didn't get it. But I'm here to tell you today how we can. Well, I had to delay completing the sermon for about a week after being sick earlier this month. In fact, it slowed me down long enough to begin questioning what I'd already decided to preach. And the more I meditated on the story of Peter, the more my attention was drawn away from him to Jesus. Yes, Peter is quite interesting, a wonderful character, but his significance for us is his witness to Jesus Christ. And I began to realize that my desire to rush headlong into preparing a sermon was actually a very Peter-like thing to do. As Jesus said in his rebuke of Peter, you're setting your mind, you're, you're setting your mind not on things, divine things, but on human things. And so you can see, I had ignored the things I ask students to do in my preaching classes. Psalter for this Sunday is from the last part of Psalm 22. Before I began reworking the sermon, I decided to listen. And what I heard is a remarkable act of praise to God I had overlooked. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. It is true that what and how the church prays is intimately related to what and how the church believes and lives as God's people. St. Augustine says these words give voice to the praise of Israel, the praise of Jesus, and the praise of the church. This is a great chorus of praise that began with Abraham and Sarah and will continue to resound through the centuries until it's taken up and perfected in the glory of God's eternal kingdom. Friends, we're here today because God has called us to join our praise with that of the whole church, to find our true life within the living praise of a people raised up by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But back to Peter. I began to understand better why Jesus rebuked him. He had answered the question Jesus put to the disciples, who do you say that I am? with this confession. You are the Christ, the Messiah. This was not a brilliant discovery by Peter or a creative insight. It was revealed to him, and his confession is itself an act of of ascribing honor and glory to Jesus. Jesus, however, did not leave the matter there, but followed with an astonishing disclosure of himself, his glory, his authority, and power to rule. And did you notice how this significant moment of self-revelation by Jesus is joined to an invitation that reaches beyond Peter and the disciples to embrace and include the crowd as well? If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? I read some commentary on these words during my sermon preparation. Some of it sounded like bad news rather than good news. 
Some of it sounded like a job description rather than the joy of knowing Jesus and sharing with him the life of God's reign. It sounded like Jesus is scolding us, telling us we need to do more and try harder, to be more sacrificial and less selfish if we want to qualify as his disciples, if we expect to find a place in God's kingdom. One writer put it this way, discipleship is not for the faint-hearted. But that left me wondering, if this is true, then where does it leave us in our all too faint-hearted, weak-hearted, half-hearted ways? Is Jesus calling for heroic faith? Is the way of discipleship open only to those who are strong of heart all of the time? Although I'd love to believe all of us can live up to this standard, I'd have to confess I'm not all that certain about myself. And if this is indeed the case Jesus is making, where does it leave Peter and those of us who are like him? As I meditated on the psalm, I was drawn again to these words. And they filled my faint heart with praise. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him, the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your heart live forever. Maybe this is what it means to deny ourselves, to take up the cross, to save our life by losing it for Jesus' sake, for the sake of the gospel, for the praise and glory of God. I was raised in a church that taught me to understand the Christian life in two distinct steps or phases. The first step or phase was making a decision to accept Jesus as my savior which I did at a very early age. As I got older, I was told it was time for the second step or phase, which was to confess Jesus as Lord and to commit myself completely to him. As some might say, to become a real Christian. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, this was communicated to us on a weekly basis, Sunday morning, Sunday night, as well as on Wednesday evenings. The sermons were largely drawn from the epistles of Paul and emphasized that we're saved by faith in God's grace alone. These salvation sermons, which tended to come from Romans more than any other book, were supplemented with preaching from the Gospels. Paul's gospel of grace got us saved, and Jesus called us to step up and get serious about being Christian, or else. Now, I say this with deep gratitude for my church and our pastor because I'm here today in part because of their witness to Jesus Christ. But last week, while I was recovering from being sick, I thought of my childhood church experience as I listened to the words of Psalm 22, and then followed its lead to look again at Genesis and Romans to hear what they say about Abraham. You know, we preachers love Abraham. Uh, Abraham is like Peter. He's one of those big characters in the Bible, and along with Sarah makes for wonderful illustrations that spice up sermons. Abraham and Sarah's story is one of ups and downs, and forwards and backwards, and success and failure, and doubt and faith, and being obedient and not so obedient, and loss and gain. The whole collection of Abraham's stories in Genesis can function like a handy homiletical template for addressing just about any issues, questions, problems, setbacks, needs, and fears and doubts that life may bring our way. But when I listened again to what Romans 4 says of Abraham, these words caught my attention. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. 
but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. I turned to Genesis 17 and read that the promise of God was given when Abraham was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him and revealed himself. I am God Almighty. And the Lord called him, walk before me. And the Lord showed him the way, be blameless. And the Lord made this promise. I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. And all of this to an old, old man without children whose wife was barren. The psalmist declares posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying he has done it. This is the gospel. This is the good news for we who are gathered here today. And this good news is for the whole world. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. You see, God has made good on his promise to Abraham. We're the fruit of his goodness, the handiwork of his grace, the sign and expression of his steadfast love, the witness to his blessing bestowed on all the nations of the world. The call of Jesus has set us in motion, summoning us to the path of faith that begins with Abraham and has its origin in the gracious activity of God. The call of Jesus if anyone wants to be my disciple, let them deny themselves and take up the cross. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. it is a promise inseparable from the Lord who calls and who speaks and does what he says. In Jesus Christ, God has turned wholly and undividedly toward his people, to Israel first and then to the nations. And because God has first turned holy and undividedly towards us in Jesus Christ, we may now live holy and undividedly before God by faith in Him, which is to praise God and give Him glory. Scripture refers to this life given by God in Christ as holy, righteous, blameless, intact, complete, mature, perfect. As God said when He appeared to Abraham, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, wholehearted, undivided. The great commandment reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. But if the hope that is given in the promise of God is forgotten, if the commandment to love God wholly with all we are and have and do is a job description, a higher standard for those whose faith is heroic, then I think it sounds rather discouraging, don't you? This is why I shared with you my struggle in coming up with a sermon for today. Where I stumbled in my desire to hear God speaking was precisely at the point of giving wholehearted love and, and devotion to God with all we are, have, and do, because we cannot do it ourselves. And no amount of scolding or shaming, no amount of inspirational and motivational talks, no amount of entertaining illustrations and sentimental stories are sufficient. We know in our hearts this is not possible unless God first turns holy and undividedly toward us without distinctions. And thank God, friends, God's glory shines brightly in Jesus Christ, who's given himself for Israel and the nations without distinctions based on any prior merit, honor, or worth. In other words, Pre-qualifying is not required, but simply trust and praise. But I keep thinking about what Paul says of Abraham. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise, but he grew stronger in faith and gave glory to God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
referred to this as a strange glory. It's a glory so strange that Peter could not recognize it in Jesus until God revealed it to him. And it is a strange glory, is it not? That the Son of Man, the one to whom is giving God's dominion and authority to rule and redeem all that is, must be rejected, suffer, and die, and after three days, rise again. Bonhoeffer says this, He does not bark orders at us, he who is Lord of all the world. He who has all the power and authority does not force us. Christ, who can make anyone do anything, comes to us as one who asks, as a poor beggar, as if he needed something from us. But he comes to us in this way as the sign of his love. He does not want to make us contrary, but rather to open our hearts so that he can enter. It is a strange glory. The glory of this God who comes to us as one who is poor in order to win our hearts. This strange glory revealed in a weak, suffering, crucified Lord is the glory of the Holy Trinity in which God's radiance manifests God's lively desire to love and be loved by us. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel, all of you of Jacob's line. Give him glory. The God of Abraham praise, who reigns enthroned above, ancient everlasting days, and God, the God of love. The Lord, the great I am, by earth and heaven confessed, we bow and bless the sacred name forever and ever blessed. Pray, my praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. Praise is the primary form of living and proclaiming the gospel. The sheer enjoyment of it. And the sheer appreciation of it before God. And the aim, our desire is to glorify God by proclaiming what he has done with our response expressed in lives of thanks and praise. You see, this is the heart of ordinary Christian faith in life. It's the recognition of the love of God because Jesus Christ is God's giving of himself in love to restore and fulfill the whole creation. And praise of God recognizes who God is and what God has done. And first of all, enjoys and celebrates the astonishing love poured out by the Holy Spirit in abundance. Today, the God of hope is calling, inviting us to share his life and his glory with the world. In the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, we hear your voice. We sense your presence. We believe that you have come to be with us. And out of the depths of your great love, you have claimed us for yourself. Open our hearts to receive you and to be responsive and receptive to your gifts and to follow your lead so that in all we do, our lives will be marked by trust and praise and you will receive the glory. Amen.